So, any questions from the room? Yeah, Hamish. Hello. Hi, y'all. Can you hear me? Hamish Tate, Wood Group, PSN. Um, I'm sure we all know what it feels like to have the six o'clock check-in to go offshore. We're all pretty knackered, and then uh, I've seen it quite often. We go offshore and start our day's work. Question was really to Jan Eric: Was we may have competent people, but with the the study that you looked into with releases for night shift, day shift, did you see any correlation with regards to when people are actually getting off the helicopter? Uh, that information wasn't available from the investigation report, so it couldn't be looked into, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a question for uh, Steve, please. Um, uh, breaking into the hydrocarbon systems that, the, the, that you explained in your uh, illustration there was seen as normal or routine by the OPS guys. Uh, so have, have we done anything to change their kind of risk or hazard uh, perception? Was there any work done on that? So yes, uh, <clears throat> although I said it's, it's, it's seen as routine, it, yes, it's a routine activity, but it, it does come at a risk with any you know, breach of hydrocarbon systems. Uh, so yes, the, 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 the team, certainly the team involved on Gannett and wider afield, are certainly more appreciative now of all the risks and what activities they're undertaking. And there's a, has there been a suitable risk assessment undertaken for the activity? Well, that, was, that was kind of what my question was. So how did we change away from the, uh, the use of the routine templates? So what have we got in place now for, for the actual risk assessment? So what's in place now is, is more looking at the case, uh, a permit, the full case permit, looking at all of the risks involved and just picking something from the system that can fit. So really how we assessed all the risks involved in the task. So yeah, we may have something in the system that maybe we could make fit, but is that the right behaviours that we want to show right through, the, right through the, the installation? And the answer was no. It's about really assessing what activity we're undertaking and are that controls and mitigations written into the work permit and discuss with the, the team. So we're very appreciative of all the risks involved. Might follow up on this. So we, we had an incident um, which involved using a routine task or a routine template for what was not really routine work. And I, and I think, um, you know, it's a long journey, but it's incumbent upon the, the leadership offshore and, and the, the folks who are on the front line to actually look at the work that's being undertaken versus whether it really fits under a routine template. Because often they're not even close, the routine templates, with respect to the, to the hazards that are being undertaken. I won't get into our specific incident, but it is a, it's a good opportunity area. It's a good question. Keith. Keith Palmer with XPRO. Uh, I really have liked what Jan Eric presented with the normalizing factor, and I guess this is really a question for you, Jeff and Steve. Are we looking at doing that here in the UK? Because when you look at the last three years, I mean, production's been down. How does that fit into it? You know, going forward, do we have a stabilizing number? You know, then there is the issue about the difference in the measurement between the Norway sector and the UK, but at least to normalize it, whether through production, facilities, I guess, works, but where is, I, I don't know who can answer that, but that is a good point. So, so following Jan Eric's presentation this morning, we will be looking at that. Uh, we, so we haven't, yeah. We, we've chatted briefly uh, offline about that, but so we will be we'll be taking an action to uh, think about normalising as we set the target for the next three years. And what about the, the measure itself? I mean, is there that? He said they had a different threshold. Or... So I think what Jan Eric showed was the uh, in the UK we're measuring the volume of re released hydrocarbons. It was the rate kilograms per second. I think was the measure that you used, Jan Eric. But I could add a couple of sentences to that. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, risk level, uh, annual risk level presentation that uh, Petroleum Safety Authority in Norway does, HSC uh, reanalyzes for uh, PSA's uh, use some of the UK data in order to uh, be able to compare apples with apples exactly, so to speak. So they apply the 
the 0.1 kilogram per second threshold and, and, and separates them in, in, in UK classification and, and Norway classification. So it's possible to, to make a, an exact comparison. When you talk about normalization, uh, one of the things that we did actually in this report that I referred to, which I didn't include in my presentation because I hadn't time, is that we have looked at different normalizations. So if you come to that task, uh, you may uh, call us and, 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 and we can provide some insight into that as well. Thank you. While I have the microphone, I might ask a question of Jan Eric. Um, the, you, I think you mentioned that you had a questionnaire that was very helpful in identifying where um, issues had arisen, the, the causes for failure to isolate properly. Is that questionnaire available publicly or is that a propri proprietary piece of, uh, piece of documentation? Uh, it should definitely not be proprietary. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. Um, Maybe it's actually uh, included in one of these two or three SPE papers that are referenced at the back of my presentation. If it's not, then, uh, then I'm sure we can provide it. So, so again, contact is uh, the essential thing. <laughs> Jeff also gave me an action to translate the Norwegian guidance sometime this year, so I don't know when we're going to do that or who's going to do it, but uh, we will pick that up. Is he? Uh, Darren Stoke of BG. Um, I've got a question. It's, I suppose it's for the panel, but it's primarily for Steve and Jan Eric. So, what we've heard in the presentation so far is approximately 28 to 60 percent of the losses of containment are down to human error or human related. What do you think our biggest challenge is? Is it competency and training? Or complacency and accepted practices. Yeah, so I think so. Competency is one element of it. Uh, so if I look at mechanical joint main, uh, the, the joint integrity maintenance part of it, so that's something I think we can close and be very specific about. If I look at the behavioural aspect, that isn't. I think so straightforward to close uh, and that's the challenge I think we pose right across the industry is how do we get to the root of the, some of the behaviours that some of our staff members choose to undertake on a given day at a given time because every company uh, across the industry has procedures and processes to manage their business and for whatever reason on that day at that time people either chose to work with them or chose not to work with them it wasn't workable or not and I think the root of how we get to or I suppose the bottom of that and, and kind of get people just to follow what's in our own processes and procedures, uh, then we're in a better place. So do I have a silver bullet to say what we're going to do to do that is no. I think it's a journey. It's certainly something that we can do by education and continual discussion. I suppose assure, check and assure ourselves when we're doing visits, the leadership on the offshore installations checking and assuring that as well. And again, setting very clear messages and directions for, the, for all members of the staff. So it is going to be an ongoing challenge. And it's not something I think we'll ever say you, you've, you've actually ticked the box that says you've made it, you've done it, you've resolved it. Because I think it's going to be a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, I think our experience is that uh, management and supervision was much more important factor than uh, competence. Uh, I could refer to this company, uh, this anonymous company, uh, which has reduced its leak uh, frequency by 80% over the last uh, two or three years. They have instituted a large supervision and uh, motivation program, which apparently, so far at least, has paid off uh, quite uh, excellently. Uh, so, so management and supervision is, is, is uh, my short answer. So, so I'll, I'll echo that. The, the, the two bookends here is, is where we're at. So um, we just finished a, a study. Our OIMs led a study offshore to, to, to improve and increase their face time on deck. And one of the small pieces of data that came out of our BBS data, our, our behavioral-based data, was that our supervisors, their, their observations tend to find at-risk behaviors 
about 30 or 40 percent, 35 percent of the time, the workforce, their at-risk behaviors are about 5 percent of the time. And so our, our supervisors are, are better at seeing the big picture. I, I, I'm not trying to be insulting, but uh, the workforce is often head down and, and tail up, and they need somebody who sees the, the bigger picture to spot hazards. So that's some very true data that came right out of our own system. On the flip side, I guess I'd put a plug in for step changes, human factors efforts that are going on. We've got a whole sub-team working on this. Um, it's a hot topic in our company right now. We're, we're actually considering a, a much broader rollout of why people do the things they do and helping them understand why they do the things they do. You, you've heard me talk about um, experience-based versus procedural-based um, type behaviors. I'm not going to cover them here, but I'd suggest you, you look at the material step changes pulled together and do some homework on this because it's really fascinating on why uh, people do the things they do, and in particular, uh, Western cultures um, like the UK and the US and Australia, who all seem to have very similar safety performance. Just to add, we're actually moving on from the first steps document that was published a few years ago. In Q3 this year, we will produce a human factors sort of self-assessment gap analysis tool online that will actually see how far or how effectively you've embedded human factors in your organization because there's certainly lots of good dialogue around it but that embedding and implementation there's still a long way to go we think any other questions no okay well, I will uh, just bring the event to a close there. I guess first I need to thank uh, Jeff and Steve, uh, I think, for their stewardship over the past two or three years on the Asset Integrity Steering Group. Uh, Steve's done such a good job that he's being promoted to the co-chair of the leadership team <laughs> and, uh, you know, leaving Jeff behind for a few months and we were going to uh, replace Steve with another uh, contractor co-chair in Asset Integrity. Keith from XPRO, uh, Peter from BP and Kenny from Petrofac their ideas and safety, just that bit of, of sharing what's going well. Jan Eric from coming over from Norway, Eric from turning up from Chevron, and actually giving us a, a pretty stark reminder that we do need to learn and that, uh, you know, it's not just uh, something you do in school, it's something you do every day when you go to work. Steve from Shell, and finally Randy from HSE. I think also the Step Change team, Emma, Jillian, Kevin, and, and Emily, who continue to tolerate my madness and the work that we're trying to achieve and Izzy who runs around and you've seen her doing the event so really really thanks to all those guys so if you can just give them a round of applause.